Everybody wants to be on the winning team, and I don't know if you've paid attention lately, but if you haven't paid attention, those of you who are LSU fans, you realize that LSU has won a couple of national championships here lately. It's okay to whoop whoop that. And uh, they've won basketball, and then they won baseball here just recently. And what you've seen throughout the country is young people in college are leaving their schools and wanting to transfer to Baton Rouge. Because, amen, yeah, because they want to be on the winning team. You, they're joining a winning team. They're joining a group of people who know what it looks like and know what it takes to get the job done and to be victorious. And when you pray, the prayers that God calls you to, the prayers, what we're going to call frontline prayers today, when you pray those types of prayers... You are joining God's winning team. I don't know if you've realized this or if you've read the end of your Bible and seen all of it, but we are on the winning side as God's people. Like he is the one who has guaranteed the victory for us in the long term throughout all of eternity. And the promises of God are this, is that he works all things together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose, it says in Romans 8. So we understand that we are joining in with God in what he is doing in the world through our prayers and that the prayers that God calls us to are for us to join his work in the world, that we're not launching out on our own and doing our own thing, but yet we're joining in to God's will, God's purposes for our lives and for his will and purposes for the lives of those around us and our community and the world around us. And that's exactly what we're going to launch into today because what we're going to talk about today is a prayer, a type of prayer that is prevalent throughout the Bible. In fact, I think it's the most prevalent prayer throughout the Bible. And yet it's a prayer that I don't think many believers, even sometimes long-term believers, realize that they have the opportunity to pray this type of prayer. And not just the opportunity, but that you're called to be this type of prayer. And it's what I would call frontline prayers. Now, I want to contrast frontline prayers in order to kind of understand it a little bit. Frontline prayers with what I call, maybe call base camp prayers. Both are part of our prayer lives and both are necessary. But yet the more prevalent prayer throughout the Bible is the frontline prayer. Now, a base camp prayer are, are simply that. So you can contrast it, think about it in, in military terms a little bit. Frontline prayers are those prayers that we pray on the front lines. Base camp prayers are those prayers that we pray when we're in our base camp and we, we need our provisions, we need our needs met so that we can go back out to the front lines and fight the battle, fight the war that God has called us to. So base camp prayers are very necessary. This is where 1 Peter 5, 7 comes into play. Cast all your anxieties or your cares upon him because he cares for you. Those are, that's a base camp prayer. Paul talks about how God will meet all of our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. That's Philippians 4.19. That's a base camp prayer that God, we, you and I have needs that only God can meet. And when we're in base camp, so to speak, to get, to get reinforced and, and to, to get ready to go back out to the front lines, which we all need in certain seasons, God calls us to pray those types of prayers. And many of us do. We, we kind of understand this, that we need to call upon God, that he meets our needs, that he lets us know what our needs are. But then there's another type of prayer called the frontline prayer, which is where we are not just praying only for our needs, but we're praying more for the needs of those around us and the world around us and, the, and, and to see the advance and the movement of God's kingdom forward, not only in our lives, but in the lives of our family, and in the lives of our community and the world around us, in the lives of, in the, in the lives of our country and, and all across the world. These are the types of prayers that God calls us to. And these are the types of prayers you can pray frontline prayers right from your living room. And there's going to be seasons where you need to know the power of a frontline prayer, where you need to understand the principles of frontline prayer. Because frontline prayer is not just for those people who are missionaries going out and taking the gospel to unreached parts of the world. They definitely are praying frontline prayers and we pray frontline prayers for them. It's not just for those who are church planters, 
But it's for those, let me tell you, there's gonna be a season, there's gonna be a circumstance, and maybe you're in it right now, where you're gonna need to know that you have the power, the ability, the authority, and that God has, has given you the principles of how to pray a frontline prayer for your family, for yourself, for your work, for your friends, for your neighbors, for those people who are close to you. I've seen it on many a parent's face as they see a, a child wander away or never come to faith in Jesus. Those are parents who need to know what a frontline prayer looks like. I've seen it on the, on the hearts and in the eyes of children who watch their parents struggle with faith and who perhaps walk away from faith. Those are kids who need to know the principles of frontline prayer. Frontline prayer is going to become a necessity in, in your life. If it's not right now, it will be at some point. And the good news is this, is that frontline prayer is a weapon of God in the hearts of God's people. It is God's weapon in the hearts of his people. God has, by his Holy Spirit, given you the power and the authority, as we talked about last week, and this is building a lot on what we talked about last week, given you the power, the authority, the ability, and the availability of his power working in and through your life to see his kingdom advance, to see the gospel move forward into the lives of other people that are around you. And 2 Chronicles 16.9 is one of the principles that goes along with this. It says that the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God is looking for people who will be committed to him. He was looking for people who will, who will focus their prayers upon his will and his guidance. And so this, this verse here, 2 Chronicles 69, it says he wants to strengthen those. Strengthen there means to, to give us the strength to prevail. That when the forces of darkness come against us, that we don't cower to them, but that we have the strength and the, and the spiritual fortitude to prevail against them. And that we pray prevailing prayers, which is a principle throughout the Bible, that we, we pray prayers that, that overcome the spiritual forces that are pushing against us. And God wants to lead us in that. And he, he leads those who are fully committed to him. A full commitment, whose hearts aren't, aren't uh, going in different directions, who haven't turned to the right or to the left, but whose eyes and whose hearts and whose minds are solely and single-mindedly focused upon his will, his desires, his goals, his direction for their life and for those that are around them. And those who can learn to single-mindedly focus their hearts, their minds, and be fully committed are those who have the power to pray what I call frontline prayers. These are those who, they don't allow complacency to enter into their life. They don't allow just, they don't just accept every wind that comes their way. They don't just accept the winds of spiritual darkness coming into their family. No, they fight against those because they know that this is God's will that they fight and God has empowered them to fight and he has called us to, to be those who fight with front line prayers, who know the will of God, who pray the will of God, who see the answers of God, who, know, who see the provision of God for their lives and who watch the power of God come into their life and through their life into the lives of other people. And I don't know about you, but that's the life that I want to live. That's the life that I see, I, I see in the Bible. I see prevalent in the teachings, the principles, and the examples given of the life that we can have. Understand, just like we talked about last week, those in the Bible outside of Jesus, everybody else in the Bible is just like you and me. They got a nature just like you and me. Peter was no different than you and I. Uh, Elijah, as we saw last week, is no different than you and I. Paul was no different than you and I. But these were people who were single-mindedly focused, fully committed, and God strengthened them and put, it put everything in them to see them do tremendous, amazing things. And you and I, by nature, are no different than they are. The same Holy Spirit that empowered the Apostle Paul empowers you today as a follower of Jesus. And when Jesus... The, the title of our series, Teach Us to Pray, where does that come? When Jesus' disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, he taught them in the model prayer that we looked at the very first week, he taught them frontline prayers. And so let, let's, let's review that real quickly. So he says, here's his model prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is a frontline prayer. God, I wanna know what your will is in heaven, and then I wanna see that will here on earth. 
And then, he, and then he goes into base camp prayers, which is give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts if we have forgiven our debtors. And then it goes back into frontline prayer. So you see, he bookends it with frontline. There's frontline prayers and then there's base camp in the middle. As our needs are met, now lead us out and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And this is the types of prayer that God has called us to. So this morning, I want to give you four principles of frontline prayers. If you can grasp these four principles of of how to pray these frontline prayers, you're going to see your prayer life begin to shift from from just general, specific, oh, God, bless me, bless them, bless this, bless that, to very powerful and specific and bold type prayers where you will know the power of God, you will sense the power of God, and you will see when God's power works, moves, and His will is accomplished in your life. So the four principles, the first is that frontline prayers expect God to answer. They don't hope, they don't wish, they don't cross their fingers and say, man, this is, maybe something will come through. No, no, they expect God to answer. A person who is praying a frontline prayer says, I know that God is going to answer because God answers according to his will. And I'm going to pray according to his will. And when I pray according to his will, I am confident that the answer will come and I expect God to answer. Frontline prayers, when you pray them, we are confident that there's somebody on the other end of that prayer. That there's a person on the other end of that prayer, that it's the living God on the other end of that prayer, that it's Jesus, our Lord and our Savior on the other end of that prayer, and that he hears that prayer and that he's going to respond to that prayer because initially, as I'll show you here in a minute, that prayer comes from his heart first. God answers his own prayers and his, he gives his people the prayers that he wants them to pray that, that move and advance his will and his purposes and his gospel and move his kingdom forward in the earth. And those are the prayers that he answers. 1 John 5, 14, 15. We've looked at this verse a few times throughout this series. This is the confidence that we have toward him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. This confidence, it's a boldness, it's a courage to know, it's a courage to face the front line, it's a courage to not back down from the spiritual darkness and the spiritual forces of this world, but to stand and fight and fight against them because I know I'm not fighting in my own power, but I'm fighting in the power of the living God who pushes back all the spiritual forces of darkness. And Jesus has defeated all the spiritual forces of darkness. It tells us in Colossians that he has made a mockery of all the spiritual forces of darkness. He has completely dismantled their power. They have no authority. They have no power. Listen, the only power that Satan or darkness has in your life is power that you give up to them. They don't have any power. If you, if you fight and push back and say, no, no, this is not going to happen. You're not going to have my children. You're not going to have my home. You're not going to come into this life. Those are the prayers. That's according to God's will. And he answers according to his will. And so we must first learn to discern God's will. We must first spend time. I tell you, we we would do so much better if we would spend hours, days, and weeks discerning God's will and then minutes praying that will. But instead, we often reverse that and we spend hours, weeks, and days begging God to do something that was never in his will to begin with. And he's never going to do that. He's never, those aren't prayers that God answers. God answers true prayers that are prayed according to his will. And when we pray according to his will, we expect that the living God will hear those and he will answer. And his power will come into our lives. It's a little bit, this is, this is back to our very first principle we talked about in the series. That we align our will with his and then we ask so let me give you an illustration. As a father, my children come to me and they always like, my, especially my girls, they're hungry all the time right now. It's just about growing kids. I, you know, they got to eat. And right now they're on a eat every hour schedule. It's just that summertime schedule, I think. It's just every hour they're hungry. And so my girls are coming to me and say, daddy, I'm hungry. It's like, okay, well, let's, we'll, we can get something to eat sometimes. Other times it's like, listen, you just ate 15 minutes ago. All right. You can't be hungry already. But they'll say, I'm hungry. Well, what do you want to eat? Donuts. <laughs> My will for your life is for you to grow healthy, to grow strong, to grow up, and to grow healthy. 
So here's what we're going to do. And so yeah, sometimes as a parent, you're just like, no, that's dumb. But no, other times you're like, no, here's the, my will for your life is better than your will for your life. So here's my will for your life, that, that you can have something to eat, but it's not going to be donuts and it's not going to be candy. It's not going to be cereal again. No, it's going to be something healthy, something to, to give you strength, something that will sustain you, something. And so you, what do you do? You're, you're correcting your children's will. You're correcting their desires so that their will aligns with your will. And then when their will aligns with your will, then what's the answer? Yes and amen. Yes, you can have that. Absolutely. I will fix that for you. I will provide for you. That's the picture that God gives to us. God, I want you to do this. My will for your life is this. My will for your life is for you uh, to advance the kingdom. My will for your life is to grow in patience. That's my will for your life. Yeah, but God, I want you to do this. Well, I want you to grow in patience. And so God is not going to capitulate to my desires. He's not going to say, oh man, I didn't think about that. I'm so glad you brought that to my attention. God's never going to do that. His ways are not mine. His knowledge is greater than mine. In fact, it needs to be the opposite, that I conform my will to his. This is, the, this is his ultimate will, that I be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus. And what does Jesus say? I only do those things I see the Father doing. I only say those things the Father tells me to say. His will, I align and then I ask. And when I align, I expect God to answer. And here's the reality. And again, this one, when I first heard this, it was a challenge to my theology. And I just want you to know, already some of you might be squirming because some of this is, is a little bit of a challenge to some of the theology you may be taught, read, seen, other, other pastors even talk about. And this is a little bit of a challenge to that theolo some, some theological positions that you may have. And it was to me when I first heard this as too, well, I was like, that just doesn't, doesn't seem, doesn't feel right. But uh, understand, what I think feels right doesn't matter. It's what God's word reveals is right, is what matters. So while this might seem a little strange, here's, here's what I think the principle is teaching. God can answer and can do his will apart from my prayers. Do not deny that at all. But for whatever reason, God chooses to use mine and your prayers to bring his will into this earth. Again, some of you are like, I don't believe that. That's okay. One day you'll grow up and you'll see. <laughs> Just as I did. That's a joke. But in all seriousness, I don't, I, I don't know why. I can't tell you why God does this. But all I know is that he does this. And, and some people say, well, that just, that, that decreases his sovereignty. I see it completely opposite of that. I think it increases his sovereignty. Because what is it? What is it? God is so sovereign that he could take my own free choice to pray over a specific matter and choose in his own sovereignty, choose to use my own free choice to pray over a matter to bring his will in to that matter. To me, that's more sovereign that he can use. He, 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 he so, is so good. He so knows that he brings all of these things to bear. And again, uh, another sort of principle that I, to kind of explain this, again, that is, it challenged me the first time I heard it. I've spent a long time processing and thinking about it and reflecting on the scripture. And I think it's true. Is that if God's will, imagine God's will as a train coming into our lives, our prayers are the tracks upon which that train moves. And again, I get it. Some of you are like, that makes me very uncomfortable. But for whatever reason, that seems to be the indication of the Bible that that's how God chooses to use his people. You have the ability to pray God's will. And as you pray God's will, you are laying a track for his will to move in and through your life into the lives of other people. Those who pray according to God's will, pray frontline prayers. They expect an answer because they know they're praying God's will. A second thing that frontline prayers is they desire God's glorious presence. God's presence is one of the primary goals of frontline prayer. I want to be in the presence of God. You can never underestimate the power of being with God face to face, to know his presence, to be in his presence, to experience the glory of his presence. When I think about this, I think of Moses when he said, God, show me your glory. It was a plea. It was a prayer. It was a cry. 
God, show me your glory. And God says, you can't see my glory and live, so I'm gonna hide you in the cleft of the rock. And as I pass by you, I'll cover you over. And then as I pass by, I'll lift my hand and you can see, I guess what I would call maybe the afterglow of God's glory. And just the afterglow of God's glory just leveled Moses. But now, because of Jesus, you and I have the, the, the privilege to go boldly into the throne room of God and get face to face with the God of the universe. Moses would have, would have given everything to be in your position, to be able to go before God. And Jesus has made that possible. The psalmist David, he prays this prayer in Psalm 27, four, one thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. This is David's prayer. Now, when David writes this prayer, this is a frontline prayer, and he is in the wilderness. He is running, he is in the desert, but his heart, although physically he is in the desert, his spirit and his heart, they are in the temple worshiping God. And they are in the presence of God. And David realizes that even though his life is sort of in disarray and fallen apart and it's chaotic and who knows the direction forward, and he's got all of these problems, here's what David realizes as he prays this frontline prayer is that God is not the source of my problem, God is the only solution to my problems. And so many of we get this confused because here's what happens is when something happens and, and we get put into the desert and into the wilderness of life and our life gets flipped upside down, the first thing that tends to happen is we run from God and we run from church and we run from small group and we go and we say, I got to go figure this out on my own. David shows us, no, we got to process what's going on in our life and process the problems of our life in the presence of God, not away from God. We don't process God away from God. We process God with God in the presence of God, and with God's people. And this is what David encourages us to do, is that frontline prayers, they expect and they wanna be in the presence of the living God. And when you're in God's presence, several things are gonna happen. You're gonna become aware of your sin, you're gonna confess your sin, you're gonna become aware of God's love and his goodness and his mercy and his grace. You're gonna to long to know him, you're gonna to long to see him face to face, face, to face. you're gonna just long to be in his presence. Frontline prayers, they wanna see the face of the living God because that's the invitation of God. A third thing is frontline prayers are bold and specific. And this is one of the biggest differences between frontline prayers and maybe base camp or just general prayers. Base camp and general prayers, you'll hear things like, Lord bless them, bless this, bless that, bless my family, bless our church, bless this food, bless, Bless. Frontline prayers are bold and specific. Because why? Because I want to know when he answers. I want to know the answer. And God calls us, look, if you've got a $100 need, don't pray for a $10 provision. You got a God who meets a $100 need when we pray. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. All the silver and gold is his. There's no end to his provision. So if you got a $100 need, don't say, well, God, I know you're, we don't serve a limited God. We don't serve a God of limited resources. It's amazing to me sometimes how we talk about God of like, oh man, you know, I, I'm just not sure if, if, if I pray over here for this, if God can provide over here for this. We don't serve a God who's got scarce resources. He's not limited by them. He provides according to his will. He's not limited by resources. He goes over and above. And so God calls us to be bold and specific. Kind of imagine in your mind, let me, let me give you kind of an example. If I go to my wife in the morning and I say, listen, when I get, when I get home from work this afternoon about six o'clock, I'm hungry and, I, and I'm gonna want food. That's a request, okay. But then I get home and she's made liver and onions, which I hate. I know some of you like it, but no, I don't. That's not food, that's, that's like feed that to the chickens. But then if I look and I say, this is not what I wanted, she said, well, all you said was you're hungry. This is food. This will fill you. No, no, be specific. I'm, I'm going to be hungry. I would love it if you would make jambalaya. There we go. Now you're spe amen. Now we're specific. That's a prayer that can get, and this is what God has called us to. When you look at frontline prayers, one of, one of them in the Bible is Nehemiah in Nehemiah chapter 1. And he prays specifically. He prays two things specifically. 
If you go and read his prayer, first, this is not part of his specific prayer, but he confesses, which is always being, being in God's presence. As I said a moment ago, he wants to experience God and be in the presence of God. It causes him to confess his sin, and not only his sin, but the sins of his household and the sins of his countrymen. But then he makes two specific requests. One, rebuild the wall. And then two, he says, give me favor with this man. And then he ends chapter one, the very last statement of chapter one, it says, now I was cupbearer to the king. So what's he saying? God, give me favor with the king. And then in chapter two, we see God answer that specific and bold request as the king looks upon Nehemiah favorably. And here's, here's where the principle comes from. It's in Hebrews 4, 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. We can draw near with confidence. And for, uh, Hebrews 4.16, it comes on the heels of 14, uh, Hebrews 4.14 4, and 15, where it talks about Jesus being the high priest who has been tempted in every way we can and yet never sinned. And he is able to sympathize and empathize with our weaknesses. So then let us draw near. It's out of our weaknesses that we come into the strength of God and we have the ability and, and the provision to do that based on what Jesus has accomplished and done for us. This is why like in, in the cross, when Jesus is, is perishing and dying, and the moment that he dies, the veil that kept God's people from the holy of holies is ripped in two. Why? Because God is showing us that he is now, because of Jesus and his sacrifice, he is fully available to all of God's people, not just to a select few known as the high priests, but to all God's people can now come into the presence of God and can come boldly and can come specifically. Let me give you a couple examples from my own personal life. One, we prayed boldly and specifically that God would heal my daughter, Evangeline, heal her ears when she was born. She was born deaf, failed every hearing test, and we prayed specifically and boldly. It did it in our kitchen. Myself, my wife, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law prayed specifically before we took her to a next appointment. God opened her ears. And the Lord answered that prayer and opened her ears. On the flip side of that, I remember when my father was dying, lying in the bed, took a took couple of days after his heart surgery that he never recovered, never woke up from. I remember specifically saying, God, I want you to heal him. God, I want you to heal him. God, please heal him. It was a specific prayer. And I can, I can remember, and this is still to this day tough for me to say, but I can remember when God said, I'm not going to. My will is to bring him home at this time. And I, I'll never forget that moment. And then my prayer was able to shift. God, let it be peaceful. And it was. It was. Frontline prayers are bold and they're specific. But they're bold and specific. Why? Because they're aligned to God's will. I can't just be bold and specific and so go in there and say, God, this is what I want. I go in there and I say, God, what is your will? And then I get bold and specific in that regard. The fourth principle is that frontline prayers are persistent and consistent. They don't give up. They don't quit. At the least little sign of trouble, they don't waver. They don't stumble. They don't fall. They consistently go because they understand the principle that God has empowered his will be done in people's lives. And God has given the provision in Jesus. This is why the Great Commission is so important to us as people of prayer and as people who want to see God's kingdom, not only in our lives, but in the lives of our children and in the lives of our family and the lives of our neighbors, neighborhood, friends, coworkers. We want to see God's gospel, God's kingdom advance. And so we have the authority based on Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Here's what it says. Jesus came and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So then he t turns it, therefore, and he says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is, this is the authority that Jesus, based in him, that we are his people, we are praying his prayers, we are praying his will, and he has the authority to advance the kingdom of God to the far reaches of the earth, including the far reaches of your family, the far reaches of your work, the far reaches of your neighbors, the far reaches of your neighborhood, the far reaches of everywhere that we go. We have this ability. So here's my encouragement to you. It's very simple. Pray frontline prayers. 
Pray frontline prayers. Pray frontline. Base camp prayers are important and you need them at a time, but base camp prayers are to get us ready and refueled and restocked to go back out and pray frontline prayers. So let me give you a, a way to do this. In Matthew 6, 8, Jesus, right before the model prayer is given, when his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And then you get the, oh, Father, hallowed be your name. Right before that, in Matthew 6, 8, Jesus says this, your father knows what you need before you ask him. Your father knows your needs. God knows your needs. God knows the needs that you have. I might not even know my needs yet, but God knows them. And so there is a dynamic to frontline prayer. And I learned this from my father-in-law. And, and I would encourage you, those of you, um, uh, I learned it uh, from him. And then he wrote it in his book called uh, Lord, teach us to pray or Lord, uh, something along those lines. You can get it on Amazon if you look up his name and look up prayer. But here's the principle. And here's the dynamic. I'm going to draw it here on the board. So God knows our needs. And so God here in heaven me here on earth. God knows our needs. And so Jesus says, pray that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the first move that happens is God makes me aware of what my actual need is. What is my actual need? I know what I feel, but I need to know what God sees as my actual need. So God makes me aware of what this need is, and he puts it in my heart. So then, in response to that, my prayer goes up for this need. And God to, to do something about this need, and God to, to, to meet this need that God has made me aware of. Then in that prayer, and here's where the shift begins to happen, and here's where many of us stop. We stop right here. I got a need, I pray, and then I... Don't do anything else. But here's how God continues this movement, is he gives us a promise. He either reminds us of a promise, or he gives us a, a new promise from his word. From his word. That God shows us a provision, shows us a promise, shows us something that, that we are going to believe and we are going to trust him for. And so that promise comes down from God. And then where does my faith now come in? Now here's my faith comes in. My faith doesn't come in just saying, okay, I've got the need, I pray about it, and then I skip. This is where the step we often skip in frontline prayer is this one right here. We don't understand the promise. We don't know the promise that God has made. We don't know the promise of how God is gonna meet that need. And so we just automatically try to skip and try to get the promise by, no, 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 no. You get the promise first, then you believe the promise. The need's not met by having enough faith to meet the need, to make God meet the need. Again, it's like I told you last week, faith is not putting the right sort of money into the slot and pulling God like he's a slot machine and hoping that you hit it. Faith is trusting the promises of God. And then as my faith grows up and increases and it goes up, God, according to his promise, gives the answer. And the answer to the need is then come. And again, what happens between here and here? That's where faith must continue to hold. This is persistent and consistent. This is where the persistency and consistency comes. That I know the will of God. I know the promises of God. I know the provision of God. And I'm going to trust in faith that in time the answer will come. Because here's what I know. Here's what a person of faith knows that prays frontline prayers. Is that all a promise from God needs is time to come to fruition. That's all it needs. That in God's time it will come. And when the answer comes, what is my response? Praise. Praise goes up. And this is the dynamic of frontline prayer. So let me show you one prayer as we come to our end here. In 2 Kings chapter 19, the prayer of Hezekiah is a frontline prayer. So Hezekiah, Sennacherib, the king of uh, uh, Assyria, is come against Israel. And although his, Hezekiah has tried to forge a peace treaty with him, Sennacherib is, is not going to have it. And in fact, Sennacherib has conquered all the lands around Israel. 
And then he mocks God. And he basically tells the he sends notice to the people of Israel, your God cannot stop me. He cannot. And he completely mocks God. And so then Hezekiah, this is 2 Kings 19, starting in verse 14. Here's what it says. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and he read it. Which the letter was from Sennacherib basically saying, your God, you can't trust him. He's deceived you. He's a deceiver. I will conquer you and he cannot stop me. That's the letter that Hezekiah just read. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and he spread that letter out before the Lord. And, here, and Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and he said, O Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. So incline your ear. This is the initial prayer. So here's the need. God, God's made him keenly aware of the need. With, through the letter of Sennacherib. God uses that and makes Hezekiah aware. Here's the prayer going up. O Lord, um, incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the king of Assyria have laid waste to the nations in their lands, and they have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they were destroyed. So now, here's his specific request. Here's his request according to the need. So now, O Lord our God, save us, please, from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. So there's his prayer. A specific request goes up. Here's the need, specific request. Then you get down to verse 20. Here comes the promise. Then Isaiah, the son of Amos, this is, this is Isaiah who wrote the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The son of Amos sent to Hezekiah saying, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, your prayer to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. The promise has come down. I have heard your prayer. What was it? That you will save us and that the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone are God. I have heard that request. Remember 1 John 5, 14. We know that when he hears us, we have what he has heard according to his will. So then you read on through the rest of the chapter and you see the people believe God and then the answer comes. And what's the answer? An angel of the Lord goes down and destroys Sennacherib's army. The people don't even fight. They don't even raise one spear. They lose one, not one person of Israel. And the people praise God. This is the dynamic of frontline prayer. This is what happens you see it in the example of Hezekiah. You see it in multiple other examples throughout the Bible. You have the ability to pray this type of prayer. So what's the need that you sense in your life? What is God making you keenly aware of? What's the prayer that goes up? And stay in that prayer until you know the promise. Don't skip this part. Don't rush through this part. This is where so many of us get tripped up as we try to rush through this part. But stay here as long as necessary to know the promise of God that you can then by faith trust and in time God will answer. And when he does, you get to praise the living God for his provision. You can pray frontline prayers. And my encouragement to you this morning is to learn how to do so so that you can pray them for your family, your friends, your neighbors, our country, and for everybody else that is in your life, who is perhaps far from God, but close to you, your prayers can make a difference in their life. Let's pray. Father, this is, uh, this is so challenging for us. God, even, even still today, Father, this, this challenges my faith at times. It challenges my prayer. It's convicting to my own prayer life, God, that sometimes I just don't wait on you. And God, I want to rush through things. So Lord, I pray for myself and for all of us that we learn to slow down in our prayers, to seek your promises, to seek your will, and that when they come, we trust them with all of our hearts, God. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.